Welcome to Sequential Geek. If you are a new visitor, somebody checking out my channel, returning to comics, you're going to find books, mainly indie type comics, Marvel and DC, if it's 10 to 15 years old and older until they change their ways, and that's how it's going to be. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for hitting me back. Let's get on with the haul. Bought some comics yesterday on the 23rd of March. And uh, this first one's the only new comic in this stack of books, but total lesson here. Cool cover, right? Titan Comics, created by Jay Young Lee. So very hot, fly, bomb ass babe on the cover, right? Got a cyberpunk vibe. And that's about it. I should have opened up the book. Yeah, my risk, four ninety nine, dollars right? Damn, uh, babe, brunette. I'm um, just digging like a Euro cyberpunk vibe for me. But then this, this style, I don't know, sketched off of an iPad. Um, it's, they need less of this. Um, yeah. Like a morose, cathartic, melancholy type vibe. Not the cyberpunk Euro babe. Less of this, less of that. And like less of this and more of that, please. More of that and that, right? Razor burn. That's what I'm talking about. Everett Hartso's gem. Razor. So this five issue series, Razor Burn. Everett Hartso does the covers for issues one, three, and five. He writes all five issues. For his IP here, Razor, that he created in 1992. Uh, October 92 was the first issue of Razor. It ran for 12 issues, and then he just keeps rebooting the brand. So by 1995 here, 95, he got Razor Burn, this five-issue series. So Everett Hartzell writes all five issues, does the covers for one, three, and five, and then he does the interiors for the first two issues. What you think about that? Definitely like an outlaw comics vibe. For show, outlaw all the way. Bloody revenge. Kind of a lowbrow amateur look. Now those power comics, you know, I don't know if you know that YouTube channel, Jim Mafood and Ben Mara, I think are on it. Um, they love to use the, the term power comics because you got these people that kind of amateur type look. Some people they only do one or two comics. They just kind of want to go for it, whether they have all the talent and resources or not. And um, I love that aspect of indie comics, just going for it, using what you've got and trying to make the best out of it. So power comics, uh, they don't necessarily have to be Tales of Revenge and stuff like that. That's usually then which carries over into your outlaw comic genre. But the power comic vibe of just like amateur going for it kind of has that look just psyched to get this book looks really tripped out crazy female superhero she's got these blades on her arm there's that comic book by Lau I think his name is Fampy Fampy that comic book from like 10 years later early 2000s she employed those same type of blades on her forearms I wonder if that's like an homage to to Razor but Got these two Razor comics. Check this out though. Same artist, Everett Hartso. Mike Taylor inks here. Larry Schlekui Jr. inks on the right. Totally different inkers, different styles, same artist. Same year in 1995, we got Razor Swimsuit Special by The Dark One, did this cover. Um, those comic books, Clore and Animal Mystic, they're from the serious comic book label that was started by uh, the Dark One, who's Greg Williams. That's the Dark One. He and uh, Joseph Michael Linsner have this other, completely separate from London Knight, their own comic book label. Serious Comics. So the Dark One did this cover, and then there's a Platinum Edition that's done by his partner, Joseph Michael Linsner, from Sirius. And... Uh, Keep an eye out for the Razor Swimsuit Special variant by Linsner. So you got your 
creator of Razor here, Everett Hartso illustrating the first page and just all these pin up drawings. A lot of indie creators I don't recognize. I think that's Ed McGinnis illustration on the left. Hannibal King illustrating Razor on the right. Joseph Michael Linsner right here illustrating her. Damn. Just like all these images are fire. And this one shot is my last Razor comic. Razor and the Ladies of London Night. This one shot out of 1997. Let's check out as far as I can go. Right, so Heather Elizabeth Parkhurst. She's got images of her trying to portray this character, Tommy Gunn. All right. Right on. I mean... Check this out. In the 90s, one of the, I don't know, tropes or, I don't know, just something that I saw in the 90s more often than not is Fumetti. Fumetti, yeah. I mean, you've seen it in other eras, but just for me in the 90s, I've seen it used a lot in ads and just a lot of indie press, amateur press doing their photo sequential storytelling. Fumetti seems to be kind of big in the 90s, so... This is um, some risque London night images. Penthouse pet of the year, Julie Smith. The Carmen Electra portrays Embrace. Oh, yeah. I'll check this one out out of Avatar Press, The Ravening. It's 2016. There's a couple of stories in here. The main one is by Jay Nitz. And then you got Jack Jadson, I think, is the artist. Avatar Presses, The Ravening. This is like four issues, I believe, all together. There's a nude variant to this, of course. A couple of vampires all spent after invading a blood car. So they drove it off to the cemetery for an all-night partying. The sun's about to come up, and they're all passed out. You know how it goes. Well, all right. So first page right off the bat. Some serious gratuitous erotica. We got ourselves some fantasy action. And we got a second story here. Supplemental story. The Ravening. Part one. This backup story is by William Christensen script, Albert Halasso pencils. So artwork's pretty dope though, I gotta say. And I gotta catch up on some reading. I've been buying a lot of Avengers back issues, keeping them in the bags, not reading them, picky about the condition, right? Buying them as either just collectibles I don't want to touch or spec buys. Combination of all the above. I grew up an Avengers fan. I was always reading the Avengers. Um, got into the X-Men later on. You know, you had your Avengers annual number 10. Introduction to Rogue. And then from like X-Men 170, 171 onward, you know, I was reading the X-Men. But I was always buying Avengers back issues. 
check out my set of comic book videos, my OG long box videos. There's uh, one video for each box, like seven boxes. I did about eight months ago. And those are the comics that I originally collected from like 79 to 89, my first era of collecting Copper Age comics. Bunch of Avengers back issues. Haven't read these babies in so long. Um, really, probably not since the 80s. So starting it off, these three Avengers uh, trade paperbacks. Um, been doing a lot more reading lately. Been buying a lot more used trades. Also, all, not only discounted because it's used, but you got buy two, get one free. And um, at the local shop, so... That's not a bad deal either. Avengers Visionaries, so focus on George Perez. And these are comics from the late 70s. Um, got a couple of Avengers annuals, 6 and 8. And then uh, Avengers 161, 162. Intro to Joe Costa. Those two are written by Jim Shooter. And then David Michelini. Introducing Taskmaster. Yeah. yeah. Let's check it out. So we're talking late 70s. Uh, first couple issues are going to be your Avengers annual stories. Uh, so I'm get into yeah, here we go. So 162, I think, is the first appearance of Yo Costa, created by you know Ultron, and then Hank Pym in the previous issue got brainwashed by Ultron. Hank Pym's mind's always fucked up, isn't it? Um, and he is sent to attack the Avengers after he gets brainwashed. So. Hot looking image of Wasp there. All right. She's looking all swinger, ready to go. Great images here by George Perez, story by Jim Shooter, Ultron. Now, this next issue, okay, so they stopped Hank Pym, right? And now the next issue, Bride of Ultron, first appearance of Yocasta. It's like he's trying to use the brainwaves of Janet Van Dyne. I am not caught up on my Ultron history. You got your brainwaves of Janet Van Dyne being used for Jocasta, but then I thought there were like brainwaves of Wonder Man that were used for creating Ultron. Is that right? How does Wonder Man fucking fit into all this shit? But, um... Great imagery there. And then moving forward, a few more issues. All right now here we got Hank Pym with his alter ego, uh, yellow jacket. And I just like the whole concept of how those Pym particles, there's consequences to these powers, to being a hero. So um, not everybody is fit to be a hero. I think that was an interesting role that Hank Pym can play at times. So, um, And let's check out that first appearance of Taskmaster. Falcon here looks like he's quitting. He's saying he joined the Avengers as part of a quota and that quota no longer exists. And he's saying he's more of a solo guy and he's taken off. I have an extra opening now in their roster. And this is issue number. All right, so this issue right here is Taskmaster's first cameo, which is issue 195. So then Falcon leaves issue 194. They don't include the covers. So 194, 195, got your cameo of Taskmaster. And then 196, first full appearance of Taskmaster. And then he goes over how he is origin story. I don't know. Does he call himself a mutant? I don't think he does. It's funny that he talks like slang more layman, yet 
here he describes, he goes, yes, see, why apostrophe C? He's like, yes, see, I was born with what the shrinks call photographic reflexes. That's the term there. And you would think if he had photographic reflexes where he can imitate not only how people move, but how they talk, wouldn't he be a little bit more... I guess it's just, yeah, it doesn't, he doesn't absorb what they know. He doesn't, even if he can sound like someone, he then obviously doesn't really gain much actual intelligent know-how. He's more smarts than more reflex, photographic reflexes. Fine. Here he is. Discussing how his ability, his powers, his photo reflexes work. He ya, he ya. So, very cool. And then here's the issues included: the two Avengers annuals, first appearance of Joe Casta, right there. Last story is like a Jarvis story, which I got to say should be more to this uh, in, in comics or just an, an entertainment or, I don't know, more subplots or side stories of just your common man taking on a bully. At first, he's successful. Eventually, this guy pulls a knife on Jarvis, but then everybody else, finally, people step in and they don't even bother to call themselves an activist. Wow, imagine that. They're just they're just helping people. No trust fund. No digital isolation through social media. They're fucking just helping each other. No one here is calling themselves an activist. Avengers 201 is that story. We got that going on. This is from the late 70s, 77, 78. And we got about like five, six years earlier. 1971. Roy Thomas, Neil Adams, Sal Buscema. Uh, Kree Skull War. Um, I honestly haven't read these since I bought them in back issues and I didn't read them all together. Um, I couldn't get into the Sal Buscema artwork for one. And just... I couldn't get into Captain Marvel. I just didn't find him interesting. I never found Rick Jones interesting. Um, I got these on discount. Decided to give it a try. Do some reading now that I've got all these years of collecting and reading behind me. We'll see how this series goes, right? Um, I'll start reading this. If it comes across like, yeah, this was just bullshit and it was really just written for... 10 year olds then i'll just fucking skip through this but avengers number 92 remember seeing this in the back issue bin check it out vision just trying to blend in with his white sweater you know it's, it's what you do um it definitely looks like sal Buscema. yeah roy thomas convinced stan lee that it was the son he never had and then you got john Buscema's son here so a little nepotism going on, the Avengers around uh, issue 92. And then eventually, uh, Neil Adams. Here we go. Ray Thomas and Neil Adams. And Vision's got some health issues going on here. So it's a cool concept. I got Ant Man shrinking down, going inside. A journey to the center of the android. But can you dig it? <laughs> I wonder if they even used the term nanotech once in this in this book. Whatever, it's all good. Um, just this will be fun to read. See right away off the bat. Now, now I'm like I want to read it. It's that Neil Adams artwork. Fuck yeah! Check out the Neil Adams. This is look at his thing though. 
War of the Weirds, you think? Not crazy about Neil Adams' thing, though. Bacow. I'm critical. Y'all leave your feedback, though, in the comments. Don't mind me. 1971. Space Odyssey. And so this came out the year I was born. So it's the Mandroids. First appearance of those dudes. All right. I think these are all consecutive to each issue. So Avengers number 94. Behold the Mandroids. All right. So there's your Mandroid. All right, then. Number 85. Got your Inhumans in here. Still with Neil Adams. Thank God. Neil Adams was a G. He was all right meeting him. People got mixed responses with Neil Adams. Um, I, I, my experience meeting with Neil Adams in 2018 was all right. I randomly stopped by his office. I saw the Continuity Comics little promo, stand-up promo that was in the, the main lobby. Guy at the front desk said that he saw Neil Adams was in. He's like, yeah, that guy comes and goes, going, going to conventions a lot because it was uh, in May. 2018 went into the office met neil adams shook his hand first thing i said was like thank you for what you did for jerry siegel and joe schuster and he just asked me what i was doing in town i told him i was there for some training with work and i'm just gonna take an extended lunch and meet you and he was just really cool he had some people waiting in the lobby for an uh, illustration so neil adams pre-scroll war written by roy thomas early 70s little tale here and I was kind of hoping that uh, uh, management with the MCU all right so crease world war check that out check out my George Perez after I start off maybe with some Neil Adams and then some John Byrne this is like Bronze Age leading into Copper Age, right? Right when I started. And then now this is like Copper Age, but then right when I left comics. So I'm going to start reading this too. Um, shout out to Triple Six. Check out that YouTube channel because uh, it's not a bad image there. Because I'm not into this Iron Man armor. Um, it's one of the reasons I stopped. I was like, this is fucking stupid looking. But I like John Byrne. And just want to say shout out to Triple Six, though. He, he, connected all these stories um we'll, we'll do these rabbit hole stories where he'll make a lot of connections with little subplots and things that might be hints that other writers have used from past plot threads from other eras and triple six will kind of bring together make connections with stories and display the issues that he's referencing along the way so he showed off Fantastic 477 when Franklin Richards obliterated Mephisto. And then you got your 12 issue series, you know, Vision and Scarlet Witch when she has her kids. But then now you got this pandemonium story. And it's like he's got this star that's forming because there's these shards that he has to collect for Mephisto. Shards of Mephisto that I like that summation of how they're probably left over from when Franklin Richards previously had obliterated. Mephisto. And, you know, it was a John Byrne story, that Fantastic Four 277 issue anyway. And a few years later, now you got this, this story written and penciled by John Byrne. So I don't think that's too far fetched of a connection. The shards were used to create her two kids, her twins. So I like the connections there. I like that. Something that I had blown off is just like, eh, what is this pandemonium guy, you know? Um, but uh, there's a actual relevancy to this dude, and I'll read it and check it out. Because even though I'm not crazy about how Marvel currently is in DC, um, like I said, you're not going to find much as far as mainstream modern comics from Marvel and and DC, probably some image stuff too. So much hype, so much variant covers, especially with, with image as well. But 
you know, doesn't mean they're not going to change their ways eventually. And, you know, just like with that renaissance that occurred around 2000, um, this new Marvel era, I don't think the, the rebooting of the ultimate title, by the way, is any type of rebirth that's going on. I think that they just, they're, they're, they're to reboot the, the ultimate title, I think is weak. Um, there's nothing modernizing. All it is, is just another first issue for people to hype on top 10 lists like cover price. Really show me something that's modern about these new ultimate comics. Show me something that um, you've been waiting for. That's overdue. That's integrating how we live and how things have changed in the past, uh, you know, 15, 20 years, even like I said, with materials, um, when you interview Brian Hitch and Mark Millar, they said that they want to incorporate more like sports equipment, military equipment type materials, looks to these people, to their outfits, uniforms, so forth. Um, characterization, bringing back about how he is somebody from the 40s, right? That's not necessarily modernizing, but you're reinvesting into stories that were already told and building upon them. Um taking them more into a modern era, uh, you know? Um, so look at that. These are the shape changers. They found one that was dead. Anyway, going off on a tangent, going off on a tangent. But my point is, is that it doesn't mean that things aren't going to change in the sense that when they reboot uh, concepts and characters and bring characters back, that, you know, they're, they're going to build upon the history that worked. A lot of that stuff involves people like Mephisto, I'm thinking. But as well, you know, um, given the relevancy that I just explained, I, I'd like to kind of take off from where I left off. Like Avengers West Coast comic book. So, got that to look forward to. Got a lot more reading to look forward to. Uh, there's a few hauls ago. I did a comic book video on trade paperbacks. So if you're looking for some stuff uh, to recommend for some summer reading, check that out as well. And almost going to wrap up this haul with one more trade, Devi, Chicago Poor's Devi. So um, a couple of years ago, I did a video on how Virgin Comics, uh, it was started by Sir Richard Branson, right? He's got his Virgin label, but then you've also got uh, Deepak Chopra. And so they started this Virgin Comics label, uh, I don't know, like I think around 2013, because they started in 20, 2006. Deepak Chopra's son, Gotham Chopra, he got together with Peter Shernan. He Peter Shernan is an American multimedia um, executive. He started his own investment company after he left Rupert Murdoch called the Shernan Group. And then he bought Virgin Comics with Deepak Chopra's son, Gotham Chopra, who's the editor-in-chief. My point is, is that they said they want to make um, these characters, the IP here, uh, into like the MCU of India. And um, Peter Shernan managed to get Stan Lee's company, Power Entertainment, to collaborate with them and create this character called Chakra the Invincible. So I find that promising. Um, they did eventually, when they bought Virgin Comics, change the brand to Liquid Comics. That's the publishing company. And then their comic book label is graphic india so if you see devi and you see graphic india it's going to be the same stories it might even be reprints of the virgin comics but graphic india is the new label fyi um the artist here i've shown off the virgin comic book called shadow hunter the jenna jameson comic book and the art inside by mukesh singh was fucking brilliant um, mukesh, mukesh singh has really grown on me I dig his stuff i've shown off a comic book, more modern comic book from Holy Cow Comics. That's an Indian comic book publishing company. Mukesh Singh's artwork in that was so fucking dope. Um, so, I mean, just look at how he uses the backgrounds here. Um, a lot of attention to detail that I think are normally left to your proverbial jobber. Um, yeah, Mukesh Singh is definitely a standout Indian artist. So there's a little perspective here on a, another publishing company from the other side of the planet. Indian-based superhero. These, these gods use humans as avatars. So they are then reincarnated 
throughout time in these ancient battles that these gods are having. The gods are kind of similar, you know, to your Norse and Greek gods where they have pride and they can be offended by each other, by the acts of, of humans and so forth. So, and nobody's perfect. And these gods are willing to interfere with, with everybody's life on earth if they need to. I'm new to the whole uh, concept of Indian mythos. Um, I've checked out some past Indian comics I've shown recently, like in the recent trade paperback comics review. And a lot of those Indian comics are based off of Indian mythology, reference to Indian gods. So here we've got Devi. She's some type of warrior goddess, Devi, incorporating this woman as her avatar. Definitely cool artwork. It's interesting. I just saw that movie, Den Gaul, about the uh, Indian wrestlers. Cool movie. So let me know what you think of Devi. And to wrap it up, let me know what you think of these, these comics. Check this out. Rescue Man. I think this is like a Christian-based comic book. Um, it definitely has like a power comic type vibe kind of like you know like somebody that is just going for it it's from 1992 you know those power comics are like 80s some early 90s cover art by dennis cohen no shit right on armor of god i just went through a few pages decided all right this looks like some type of Power comic, like low brow, semi amateur type look to it, and um, fuck it, go for it. Rescue Man, the Armor of God. All right, then. These last three, this is an eight issue limited series, The Resistance. Man, I've been just subconsciously been leaning towards these cyberpunk comics that I've been finding it seems more often than not now and then. The Resistance. So November 2002, it's your first issue here at the Wild Storm. Justin Gray and Jimmy Palmiotti wrote these comics. Juan Santa Cruz is doing the, the art here. So all eight issues were collected by IDW in 2008. It's the year 2280 in New York City. Toxic chemicals have ruined the world's ecosystem. So everyone's being regulated by this global control system, GCC. I got this, you know, resistance against the totalitarianism. It's ruling everybody's lives, regulating the birth rate. Anyone over 65 cannot have health insurance in these stories. Unauthorized, unplanned births are called strays, and they're just cast out of society. And I think that's what this, this hacker guy is. This dude here ends up joining this resistance, right? Firefly ad, nice, especially for a comic called Resistance. On the back, there's the snipes. And that is my haul. Y'all, thanks a lot for visiting. I appreciate you stopping by, giving me a chance. Much love. Till next time, keep on reading, keep on collecting. Peace.